Welcome to the Rap Race to Five podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. Here to challenge you to think out of the box, your hosts, Felipe Mejia and Diego Corzo. What's up, Diego? Thank you so much for coming today, bro. We're going to be talking about the 10 questions that we get the most on our Instagram about real estate investing. Yeah, man, I am very excited because these are questions that came from our listeners, from our followers, and they are from all over the place, right? They, it's about getting started. It's about goal setting. It's about like rat race, all of that stuff. So I'm excited. Let's get to it. That's so funny. Before we get started, stay to the end though, because me and Diego explain our inside joke about eagles and penguins and would we have been friends in high school? Let's get started. Diego, what's up, dude? I'm super excited to talk about today's podcast because I did an Instagram story uh, earlier this week uh, mm -hmm. and we asked the, our, our, our followers, we said, hey guys, what are the top 10 questions that you would wanna hear uh, answered on the Rat Race to Five podcast? And, 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 and these 10 are the ones that came up the most. And I don't wanna say them all, we'll go one by one. Diego mm -hmm. is seeing them for the first time today. Yes. So let's do this, Felipe. You're catching me by surprise on a few of these questions, so it's gonna be good. Yeah, it'll be it'll be super good and it'll be transparent. Um, but mm -hmm. for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, you can see that I'm in my cabin that I just got in Gatlinburg. This will be my second one for short-term rental. Um, we're actually getting it ready and getting it fixed uh, to start renting. But all that to say, let's get started with number one. So Diego, I'm gonna ask you, and then what I'll do is I'll answer it myself. Mm -hmm. How to start investing if I'm in college? Believe it or not, that was one of the top questions. These are not in any order, but that was one of the ones that we got the most. Like, how do I start investing if I'm just in college? Like, can you give us some creative ideas? What do you think? And they yeah. mean investing in real estate, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So funny enough, a lot of people tell me, what would you do different when you were in college or in high school? Uh, because I read Richard Port that when I was 21, I was in the middle of college. What I would have done is I would have asked my dad to buy a property with me or basically with me as the manager with some kind of equity so that I could house hack it while I was living in college. Because I went to, so I grew up in Sarasota, Florida, but I went to college in Florida State. It would have been great for my dad to buy a second home, let's say 10% down or maybe 5% down because I'm gonna be living in it. And if worse comes to worse, 20% down investment property, right? It doesn't matter. But the idea is that I would move into the master, rent out the other three rooms, for example, if it was four bedrooms, I would learn the property management side, live with my roommates, make some cash flow, and then sell it four years later if the house has appreciated. Mm, that makes sense. That's that's a good strategy. I think that's, that goes the same with what I would wanna do. If someone's in college and they wanna start investing, I would show the numbers to their parents instead of renting for four years versus buying for four years. I think a lot of the times lack of education is what stops a lot of people from investing. I think you would agree. Mm -hmm. um, I think if somebody read the books, did the math, figured out what it would take for a student to rent for four years versus investing for four years, how would it positively affect their credit, their uh, loan history, their cash flow, their tax incentives, as well as you know building up their credit by buying a property and uh, starting that relationship with a bank. So if I was in college or about to start, what I would do is I would go to my parents, talk to them about the difference between renting and buying, uh, and then like you said, maybe sell the property at the end of, of, my, of my college and even make some money off of it. So I think educating my parents is what I would do uh, to start investing in college because you, you don't have work history and you don't have probably have the money. So I would mm -hmm. go to a private money lender like my parents or, or someone I know and educate them on that they're going to make money through this process. Yes, yes. And then the other thing that's very important too is that house hacking is gonna be the best way to, to get started. And one of the things that not many people know is that even if you as a college student, let's say you, you do have a job, um, you, your parents can give you a gift for the down payment or a family member. Up can you to explain 14, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, one of the ways to get the down payment 
is by getting a gift from a family member and it can be tax free up to $14,000, which is great because this allows a person to basically um, to basically come up with maybe $14,000, right? Uh, that that can be used towards a down payment, maybe some closing cost, all of that stuff. But it has to, I believe it does have to be as an owner occupant and it has to be a family member. I like that. See, those are the little things that I think if people were a little more educated on the process of how real estate investing works, they mm -hmm. might be more prone to do it and take action. So great strategies. I think uh, all three of those would, would, would be very beneficial. Um, and yeah. and then house hacking through college obviously right like if you buy a house you obviously want to rent the bedrooms out to maybe other college uh friends of yours that you were going to pay rent at a apartment anyway so why not start investing as early as possible yeah i lived with the same roommates for three years two or three years and we lived in the same place now looking back i'm like man we could have saved like i could have saved money on rent help my dad build some equity and all that stuff i agree 100 percent. all right so let's move on to number two uh, number one was how to start investing if I'm headed to college. Um, so I think that it's going to help you out a lot. Number two is Diego, would I pay down debt or invest? As you can imagine, this is like the number one that I got. People mm -hmm. are always like, should I pay down debt or should I, or should I invest in real estate? You know, which one should I do? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. So it's really important to note how much in debt you're in and what those payments are. Cause I think it's very important. Like if, if the only bad debt, right? And there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. Bad debt takes money out of your pocket. Good debt is money that you have to pay that you owe somebody, but like like the bank, but somebody else is paying it for you, right? Bringing it back to rich debt, poor debt. Exactly. Now what happens is I think that if the debt, if you only have, let's say a car, right? Uh, then at that point I would say definitely start investing in real estate. But if you have like $500 in credit card debt, $1,000 in student loans, 750 bucks in your car payment and all this other stuff, I would say go a little bit more like that Dave Ramsey route for a year, try to pay some down and then invest. But it really depends on how much debt you have. That will be my, my suggestion. If you have just one, if you only have a car loan, I would say start investing uh, right away and start investing with low down payment if possible. Again, taking it back to house hacking um, so that you can get started on the snowball earlier and faster. I like that. Uh, I think personally, I'm gonna go a little bit different route. I would say start investing regardless. I think if you can afford to make the minimum payments, then you need to as quickly as possible jump into some sort of real estate investing that cash flows so that that property can help start paying down your debt. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna get into like a 1% rule, neither though. So don't get into a, a, a cash flow producing property that does a hundred bucks. I think that's terrible advice, actually. I think you need to find a property that does 500 plus. Um, and then from there, use that money to attack your debt, right? And mm -hmm. then as the prop, and then continue to pay the minimum payments on your, on your debt uh, until you can, um, make more money off the property. So that we're either refinancing it, pulling a line of credit on it, or even selling it to pay off the debt. But I would say as quickly as possible, get into some cash flow producing assets um, or, or like slash or next, um, mm -hmm. lower your expenses a little. So if you're living in a house, see if you can house hack, if you have the availability to. Um, if you have a family, that's still not an excuse. You can get a duplex, triplex or quadplex with the same five or less percent down and then you can house hack the rest of it now minimizing or completely taking away your largest monthly expense which is which is your mortgage right because mm -hmm. if you're house hacking with a with a multifamily um then you can help you can you can go that route so those are two very good options as to how to help um get out of that debt but i personally would say you got to have an investment mindset versus a scarcity pay off my debt mindset it's going to take you years to pay, like, pay off that debt where that those years you're never going to get back and your properties could have been appreciating in value. Mm -hmm. Now, Diego, you're a realtor. Can you talk a little bit about getting uh, if, if, a, if a lot of people are like, well, I have kids. I can't house hack. Can you mm -hmm. talk about the, the multifamily strategy that you can use to put a low down payment down to still alleviate that large um, expense that you have monthly, the mortgage? Yeah, for sure. And here's the one thing, too, is that 
you can get a single family home, right? Like it can have a house upstairs and the basement downstairs and you can rent it out, maybe turn it into a studio, right? But what's cool about the house hacking strategy for a family is that you can get a duplex, triplex or quadplex with three and a half down FHA loan and understand with the understanding that yes, it's not gonna be sexy, it's not gonna be awesome when, when, when you have a family there, but at the end of the day, you're paying down, like the goal is for this to be your first property so that you can get started in real estate, sacrifice a little bit so that you can get the rewards later. Now, with an FHA loan, of course, three and a half percent down, so that allows you to, um, to live in one side, rent out the others, and then from there, you can move out after a year or two years and do it again, or after that, get the home that you really want for you and your family. Now, the other idea is that you can also get a house in a nice area that has an ADU. So this means that you can rent out, a nut, like it, it might have a slab house or some, some kind of, uh, it's ADU accessory dwelling unit, and, uh, and that allows people to also rent out that side while you living in the main area. So I've actually helped a couple of people buy those types of homes here in Austin. And at the end of the day, it's sort of like a detached duplex, which is really good because it has its own entrance, its own privacy, all of that stuff. The one thing, Felipe, that I did wanna say about paying down debt too, or like debt overall, we've been talking a little bit about doing the house hacking strategy, right? But and you might say, well, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to sacrifice or anything. But if you are in bad debt, you, unfortunately, you went at it, like you borrowed from your future and now you're having to pay the consequences. Sadly, but it's the truth, right? So if you went on trips, if you went, if you bought a Camaro or a Corvette when you really didn't, uh, didn't earn the right yet just because you just because you got a great first job and stuff like that, you're, you borrow from your future and now you have to take responsibility if you want to grow your real estate portfolio, if you want to build passive income and achieve financial independence. Yeah, and I'll say one more thing about this and then we can move on because we're only on number two. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have noticed, and I think Diego, you'll concur to this or, or you'll at least understand it. It seems like people of wealth buy the toys when they're needed. And what that means is you have a Tesla, but you didn't buy it until you had a tax bill of like a bajillion dollars. And now you're like, <laughs> I literally cannot buy a cheap Honda Civic because it will not give me the tax break that I need. Like exactly. you need an expensive, heavy car that's gonna give you the tax breaks that you need. And you need to be able to write off those taxes. So it's almost like the wealthy that understand financing um, know that they have to do that. For example, um, I know, for example, Ryan, right out in Vegas recently had to buy like a Porsche or Ferrari or some, some heavy SUV, but he bought it in an electric vehicle, uh, it as an electric vehicle. And he talks about it openly on his TikTok that he has to do that because if he's, you know, it's a tax write off, right? Mm -hmm. So it helps him. Um, so that's the difference between those that, that, that don't invest correctly. And those that are, I almost want to say like the tax uh, code like incentivize us to, to succeed, to, to buy nicer things. So, um, exactly. I know that's why you bought your Tesla for sure. That's why I'm buying mine. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's a way to get, to not pay as much in taxes. Correct. Okay. So number three is, uh, Hey guys, my parents won't let me invest because I'm not old enough yet. Um, so I'm wondering, I, I don't, I, I would assume 21, but maybe he's younger. Um, uh, you know, what should I do? Uh, on this one specifically, Diego, uh, in my notes for myself, I wrote education, uh, for myself is most important. You have to trust that your parents know best. Sometimes they don't, right? But I'm not here to say that. But I know that if you can educate yourself, then your parents might see you in a different light when you're speaking about investing money and all that. Maybe you're just not, you know, presenting the facts yet in a way where they feel comfortable uh, allowing you to invest if you still live under their roof. So for this one, I just wrote a simple answer as educate yourself, show them that you're interested in. And I think that any loving parent at a certain point will be like, okay, 
I think he gets it enough to risk money on investing in this uh, these asset classes. Diego, what do you think? Yeah, I would. I totally agree with you. And I feel like the education, just like you said, has to go both ways, right? So you, as the kid, need need to be educated. But also, it is your job to educate your parents. And coming from a, like, I'm the first of my family to come to, like, high, like, to graduate high school, college, all of that stuff, I had, I had to be the one to educate my parents on, once I learned about financial literacy and all this other stuff, uh, I was the one that taught my dad about rich dad, poor dad, and now my dad has, like, over 10 properties, right? Uh, but if but if I had not taught him that, he probably wouldn't have caught the bug or understand the power of passive income. Uh, and it's our job to teach our parents um, that it is possible and how wealth is can be created in this country so that our parents are not just working, 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 working until they're 65. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I think educating... Uh is very important and like you said it's a two-way streak if you want your parents involved um, or if you want anybody in your life involved in real estate that you're going to be investing in you know it's money 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 talk so you have to be able to educate when it comes to that so i think i think those are good answers for that one for sure mm -hmm. yeah awesome okay so number four diego uh is what if the market turns this is one that's on everybody's mind mm -hmm. what if the market turns uh, what are you doing? So Diego, I'll let you go first and then I'll answer after you. Yeah, I would say that you, I would recommend, depending on what stage you're in, but especially if you're in the beginning, like if you're on your first 10 properties, I would say do not buy properties for appreciation. You have to buy properties for cash flow. You get in trouble when you're buying property solely on appreciation and uh, and you're betting that the market is going to continue to go up and up and up and up and you don't even tap into the equity that has been created so that is very important you want to make sure that the property makes sense cash flow wise because if the property goes down like if the if the property goes down a hundred thousand right but the rent still keeps on paying the mortgage, then you're fine because real estate is cyclical. So it's gonna go up and down, up and down, like what happened in 08, uh, 07, whatever. Uh, we were on a run of like, what is it? Like 13 years or something now, over 10 years. So from that perspective, uh, I feel like if you're buying the properties for cash flow and they make sense now, they will continue to make sense in the future, even if the rents go down by 10%. Yeah, you know it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I've I've always just invested for cash flow, right? I'm not I'm not following a trend. I'm trying not to follow the equity, even though I feel like I sometimes should have, right? Like investing in Austin would have been a great move when I first met you, but I'm just not a a uh, a person for equity. I'm not that risky, um, mm -hmm. and I should have been, right? Like knowing now, right? Like I, I could have. Uh, I just don't see the cash flow there. But obviously, you guys are crushing it there. Um, so what if the market turns? It's like Diego says the equity that you have now in your properties go ahead and lock it up put it in a heloc you have five years with it you're at least guaranteed that equity for five years and so forth and so on with some banks i don't want to say some banks have clauses where if the market turns they can close your heloc so you have to be careful and educate yourself in that regard but if the market turns and you want to be secure with the equity and, and, and value that you have in your properties just put it in the line of credit and double check that the bank is not going to close it off the second thing uh, you don't have to worry about that if the rents are covering the mortgage and then giving you some uh, cash flow left over. In most markets that I know of, now I, I obviously I can't say all of them, but in most during 08, 09, and 2010, rates of rent stayed pretty much the same, if not started going up because people were losing their houses and they couldn't buy, they had to rent. So that being said, when a market turns, if you're if you're renting for cash flow, you're going to be okay. Now, if you're a flipper or if you're in it for equity, then that might not be, you know, you're, you're probably going to get burned. Uh, but to safeguard against a lot of those things, it's definitely buy properties for cash flow and everything else is just cherry on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally yeah. agree with you there. Okay. Go to number five, Diego. What's the fifth question that was asked? What you strategy is best? You hear everything. So like oh, you hear about all comma, strategies. You hear everything. Got yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you hear comma, you hear, yeah, exactly. You hear it all. 
And you do, you hear Burr, Line of Credit, E-Log, you hear flipping, wholesaling, you hear all these strategies. Mm -hmm. So what is the best strategy? Um, I don't think there's a best strategy, but I'll let you go first, Diego. What do you think? Yeah, the, the strategy is gonna be the one that works best for you based on what you want. So Correct. for example, if your strategy is to achieve, for example, financial freedom in the next five to 10 years, then starting to house hack is going to be a great opportunity because number one, you can buy an owner occupant home once a year or every two years, right? You can get a maximum of 10 houses. So one of the things how I did it is I bought my owner occupant home, saved some money, bought an investment property, then bought my owner owner occupant home number two, continue to save money, bought more investment properties, then bought owner occupant home number three. And then that began to snowball. Um, but that's because I wanted cash flow much faster. I wanted to achieve financial independence. If right. my goal was to increase my income, then it would have probably, I would have gone on flipping properties. Because at that point, I knew that if I can flip a property and, and my numbers, and I only invested in properties where I could make around 40,000 bucks, then I knew that I could do that more and more. But that's not, that's not what I wanted in the beginning. At first, I wanted to invest for passive income because I wanted to reach my level of the level of financial independence so that I could do whatever I wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Um what strategy is best? I, always, I hear this question a lot and I hear a lot of people with the answer. Oh, this strategy is best. This strategy is best. I think personally, it's, it's person specific. What if your goal is time freedom? Well, what if your goal is a net worth number? What if you want to quit your W-2 job? What if you love your W-2 job and still want passive income? So I think it's not about what strategy is best. I don't think this is a vertical thing. I think this is more linear. I think it's more about what seat at the table are you interested in and which, like what strategy best suits that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone once explained it to me, like what is the best outfit to wear? Well, it's what function you're at. At a wedding, you're not going to wear, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, but you're also not going to wear a three-piece suit um, to go, you know, to, uh, I don't know, to, to, to a party at the lake, right? So I think personally, uh, it's all about what does, what strategy fits your needs best. Mm -hmm. Wholesaling is quick money, but takes time. Flipping big checks, but takes time, cash flow, small checks, but it's cash flow monthly, right? Not a lot more work after you start. So it's all about what strategy uh, fits you best is what I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. And one for, and for example, if you are going to be um, investing for cash flow, then a house that's going to cash flow a hundred <clears throat> bucks a month is not going to make it right. Just no. like we were talking about earlier, if your goal is for cash flow to basically retire or get financial freedom as soon as possible. You need to get creative, invest in markets where there's more cash flow, like Felipe was saying earlier, that those like 400, 500 a door or like, like a property are going to serve you best. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, Number six. Go for it. My significant other doesn't want to buy real estate investments. What do you think about that, Diego? What would you tell someone married, uh, you know, about investing in real estate? How would you go about that? Yeah, I would say, um, so everybody, so there's a couple of questions there that I would ask, right? You first have to see what the risk tolerance is of your significant other, because somebody, um, cause there might be, if, if you have a discussion, they're like, well, I'm afraid that we're going to lose it all or this or that. It's like, well, how much do you need in the bank so that you feel safe before I start investing in real estate? And for your significant other, it might be 10,000 or 20,000 in the bank. And then that way, your significant other knows that they're safe. If anything happens, you have 20,000 in the bank and you can invest the rest. So it's very important to understand what that floor is for savings 
so that then you can invest the rest, number one. Number two, education from both sides, it's very important. So again, if the couple can read Rich That Poor That, maybe like at the same time and then talk about it and stuff like that, I feel like that that would be good. Uh, and then, yeah, those those will be the things that I would say. What about you, Felipe? Uh, I think for me, I, I think uh, ramming it down their throat about real estate, forcing your significant other to do what you want them to do are the exact opposite of what you should do. That That's is true. not how you get somebody on board. You want to educate somebody on what it is that you're trying to do. If you can't convey to a child what it is that you want to invest or how you want to invest, don't expect your partner or significant other to understand it either. You have to be able to explain it with numbers, with data, uh, with KPIs. You got to know what you're doing, what the goals are, what the plan is for the property, one, three, five, 10, 15 years down the road, if there's partners involved. So I think educating your spouse on what it is that you want to do uh, and then showing it with numbers and proof is really good. So like, for example, Diego or I investing somewhere, you could use our numbers as proof to them. Hey, I don't have to remake the wheel. If Felipe bought, you know, I don't know, a cabin five years ago and every single month it's doing this amount of cash flow. Why wouldn't I buy the one next door? You know, I get this question all the time. Felipe, why did you decide to invest in Gatlinburg? You must have done a ton of market research. You must have done this, that, the other. Now, this isn't financial advice, but I can tell you this. I didn't do more than maybe 30, 45 minutes worth of research because everyone else that's investing up here has already done that. And I'm just basically following suit. So when you're explaining something to your spouse, let them know that there's already prior traction in that space of real estate. You know, you're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to rent out containers in Colorado because I think that's works. No one's done it before. Maybe someone has, I don't know. But like you want to follow what other people are doing in real estate uh, because it already has and shows proof of concept. So I think that's really important. Uh, yeah. And then books, like you said, I think reading books is crucial and educating your spouse on what it is that, uh, that, that you want to do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, number seven, what would you tell yourself if you had to start over or lost it all? Hmm. It's a good I'll one. Let you, I'll let you start that one. Yeah. What would I tell myself uh, if I had to start over or lost it all? Uh, as long as I still have the education that I have so far or the, the wisdom that I've gained, I think I'd be okay. Uh, one of the things that I would tell myself is start sooner is number one. Start as soon as you can afford to do it. Uh, you don't have to wait two years like I thought. Like you can partner. You can. You, there's different ways to get involved in real estate. Uh, and then the la uh, there's two parts to this. And, and then the last part to that is going to be like, uh, know that a slice of a watermelon is still more fulfilling than a full grape. A lot of times people want to do everything on their own and they can only get so far by themselves. It's so much easier to go with partners, right? So go with other people to take on bigger and better deals. Um, and then the last thing I would tell myself is I deserve it. Like for the longest time, Diego, you've heard me say this a couple of times. Like I, I always felt like I didn't deserve it because I wasn't smart. I, I just, that sounded really funny, but like, I just don't, think of myself as like a smart person, but a lot of people do, but it's just because now I highlight my strengths over talking about my weaknesses. Like I'm mm -hmm. a, like, now it's a joke. My weaknesses are a joke to me, right? Like I'm not good at Excel sheets or I'm not good at, you know, implementing and things like this, but I know what I'm good at. And, and, and I, now I highlight those and I look like geniuses to people because I do what I'm good at very well. And I mm -hmm. don't focus on my weaknesses. So I would tell myself those two things start early uh, and sharpen your strengths versus trying to fix your weaknesses. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. That's awesome. If I were to start all over or I lost it all, I'm going to answer this two ways. If okay. I, if I had to start over and then I didn't have the connections or the education, like the knowledge that I have now, I would volunteer and work for free for like somebody else for like six months be in the industry that i really like and then after that education then apply it on 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 my own uh one of my mentors osborne he says that you should only focus when when you're working you should only focus on on two things you either work for knowledge or for equity don't just work for the money so no matter like there are some people who are like well i'm gonna get this very high paying job this and that 
But unless you're going to be making that money so that you can invest it, then it's pointless. But you need to start focusing on working for knowledge or equity. So those are very two, two important things. Now, if I had the knowledge and the connections, and let's say my net worth went to zero, I lost it all, uh, I would go all in to building my money machine again, which has been being a realtor, for, for example, and then start investing again start investing again uh, from the perspective of, because you already know what to do is just that you're at zero. So I would go back to what my unfair advantage was back in the day, which was time. And again, I would just partner with people, leveraging my knowledge, leveraging my time, and I would leverage other people's money from that perspective. Mm, I like that. That's good. So the next question is, um, how do you plan your goals? How do you plan your goals? I literally just copied and pasted the question. Um, I, th I think I'm going to answer that with one word and that's selfishly. I think I would be, I, <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to be a great father if I have all the time in the world for my son, but I don't have any money to feed him or house him, right? Then I'm just gonna be a loving father with nothing to offer. And you can't feed love to a child, right? So I think I plan my goals selfishly because I know that they're going to positively affect those I love. You always hear the same thing, money isn't everything. But I think I've added to that and it's like, okay, you're right. You, I don't love money, but money does affect everything I love. So I might as well get good at it. And how do I plan my goals? Well, I plan them around three things. Does it get me closer to God? Does it get me closer to family? Or does it get me closer happy? And if, as long as it fits one of those three things, then it's going to be a goal. And those are selfish for me because I know that those are going to also positively affect those around me. So I plan my goals and my actions based on how does this help me selfishly? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm like, oh, all for me. I, my family and my son are part of me. So it's like, how do I, how does this positively affect us as a family? Um, and that's how I look at my goals uh, from that perspective. That's, that's really good, Felipe. On, on my end, uh, I plan my goals more in a year to maybe like three years. I don't usually do like a five year or 10, 10 years because there are so many things that can happen with a yeah, business, sure. with partners, like you never know who you're going to meet that next year, what opportunities there are. So I keep myself open to opportunities, mm -hmm. pursuing the goals that I set for myself. Uh, and those goals uh, do either have a timeline, uh, are quantifiable. Uh, they like I, uh, I want to make sure that it wouldn't be, I want to read more, right? It would be, I want to read one book a month as an example. So it's more like action-based goals that build on the habits for the person that achieves those certain goals. Like if I want to become a millionaire, let's say by age 30, you should have the, the habits that a millionaire has and apply right. them into your life so that then you know that the money is going to get to you later Maybe not right now, but the habits are building you towards that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, you've always said, right, you got to become that person that you want to be before that, that like comes out, right? Like you got to be mm -hmm. a mental millionaire before you become a millionaire, right? This is why no one or most of the people that are, that win jackpots lose it all because they're not millionaires, right? They have a million dollars, but they're not millionaires. Um, so I always, I, I made a post about this on Instagram the other day is like, I, I was, uh, I had a picture with my son and I wrote like, son, I promise to make you a millionaire before I give you a million dollars, right? Like what I'm saying is I'm going to educate my son on how to manage a million dollars before he gets any of the properties or assets or businesses that I own. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. We're sidetracking a little bit about how do you plan your goals, but that's no, part of it, good. right? So for me, this that's important, good. right? It's like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. And at the end of the day, um, I was I was in I was in a in a room with some of my mentors and 
one of the guys mentioned that, I'll, especially with with the family, right? If you have a high net worth, I was in a room of guys that they had a net worth of over 10, 10 million, 15 million. And they said that they look at their family. And when, when you look at your family, they see that the main guy, the father, let's say with the businesses and everything, he's the quarterback. Well, if he gets hurt, or if he's a main player, then the team suffers, right? But if you see yourself as the coach of the family, as the coach, then you know that you can make certain moves. And if something happens to your players, you can adjust because you're the one with the knowledge and you are sort of like in the sidelines, but you have, you have the coach mentality. So with your wealth and your family, treat yourself like the coach, not the quarterback. Um, that's that's what I would say there, because then you can plan your goals just like what you said, right? You're not going to give your you're not going to pass a million dollars to your son. That's like the perfect example. You're going to coach your son to become a millionaire and then he can inherit whatever he wants from that. perspective. Correct. Exactly. So, no. Yep. Yeah. I totally get that. Really Great good. explanation. I love it. Um, number nine. Who do you look up to the most and why? This one kind of caught me off guard because mm -hmm. we're both mentors in Rat Race to Fi. And I was like, well, whoa, who do I look up to? That's a great question. And I think a mentor that's not being mentored is probably not the best mentor because then they're not they're not practicing what they preach to that level, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're telling people that they need coaching or mentorship, you should be getting mentored as well. Um, so I'll let you go first on that one. Uh, who do you look up to uh, Who and why? Yeah, for me, it is actually my business coach, Matt Aitchison, Matt uh, Matty A. Uh, he is two years older than I am. I think he's 32, 33. Uh, but we met at a GoBundance event back in 2014. And uh, I looked up to him a lot because both on the family side, like he's a great father, uh, a great husband. Uh, he has, and he's also a great entrepreneur and he has built uh, different companies, different things that uh, that as an entrepreneur, I see the values that that he has, and I really like them. And that's something that that's somebody that I look up to. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's also somebody that I can have conversations as a friend. But he's also my he's also my coach. So there are times where we have more of like that coach mentee type of relationship, and it's awesome because he's he said and then he's accomplished a lot more but i but i know that we have both elevated so much since we've known each other uh and that's that's why i look up to i like that i like that so who do you look up to the most and why i think personally i look up a lot to my mom just because of the adversity that she's had to go through um and like coming to this country undocumented not knowing the language and then like trying to fit in learning the language getting her documentations correctly um, you know, doing taxes and just like learning all that stuff. I feel like for me here, anytime I run into an issue or a problem, I'm like, my mom had it worse. I have no mm. excuse, right? Yes. I'm big on like not being a victim and not having that mentality and not like you always say this too, like, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. But it's like, why is this happening? What can I learn from this? How can I get better? How can I do better? Um, so yeah, you know, I think personally, um, who do I look up to more? It's, it'd be definitely be like my mom. And then I have, uh, my mentor Dom. Uh, I don't speak a lot about him and that's off of his wishes. Um, and he just kind of helps me out a lot through, through his, um, through his, he's only in business, not in real estate, but just listening to him. It's, he's just a wealth of knowledge. He's like a dictionary of knowledge. It's, it's incredible. Um, so those are the two people that I look up to the most. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, that's a pretty simple answer, but that's, that's yeah. what it is. No, um, it's good. It's good. And, and the yeah. number 10. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, no. I mean, like at, at the end of the day with like I, with my parents, right? My mom, my 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 dad as well. You're 100 percent right. Like with the adversity and everything, mm -hmm. it's sort of like, look, no matter what we have challenged now and me with DACA and everything going on, I'm like, it's still easy. Like it's still it may not be easy, but it's less hard than what my parents had to go through the being scared of certain situations, hearing my mom cry and like all these other things, right? At the end of the day, um, it's they showed us the resilience and what the resilience can do in this country. And then, yeah, you and I both have applied that.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's move on to the last one. I That's reworded what? it. I reworded number 10. Uh, does rat race work? Someone was asking, uh, like, is rat race real to where I can learn or is it just another mentorship? And you, you know, mean rat race to FI, right? Not rat, rat race, race as the rat race. <laughs> yeah, but right. rat race Thank to FI. That. Yeah, rat race to FI or mastermind. Um, I get I get this more than not, and I'm not going to name any names because uh, it doesn't add value, and I know how you hone on me about that, so uh -huh. I'm learning. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> add value, so I want to name But I hear a lot of masterminds where people go and they get burned in this aspect of it's just an upsell to the next thing. Hey, here is how you build a car. Pay me a little more, and I'll show you how to put the engine in the car, right? It's like, it's like this always upsell, so people are like tired of hearing that. Like, yes, I'll get into a mastermind and it's like, watch my, let's go super generic. Watch my flipping course. I don't know. Right. That's super generic. How to flip a house. Here's my course. And it's like, if you want the list of contractors, I need an extra $10,000. If you want the contracts to close the deals, it's another $5,000. And it goes on and on and on. And I, I, I get why people are asking this question. What he really means is, Felipe, am I going to be sold again on something that I need to invest in real estate and rat race to find? I know that that's what this person wants to ask. They're just afraid to. I'm going to tell you right now, me and Diego are very careful about who we let into rat race, who we let talk at rat race, and if they can sell anything. 99% of the time, we do not allow a sales pitch on our calls, and we will not upsell you on everything. Um, one of the things that I'll give a perfect example is today, Diego, I don't know if you noticed on Slack, Someone asked for a contract to close a deal and like 10 people offered to help them. Like, hey, here's the contract that you can use to hold a deal, you know, revise it for yourself or call me if you need help, text mm -hmm. me, you, you know, and that's what Rat Race is about. That's what we built. It's a community of people helping each other to further in real estate investing. Yes, exactly. And if you notice that at the end of the day, why Rat Race, why it does work, Rat Race 2FI is because we're a community that we're looking to help each other. So the person that asked that asked on Slack, right? Mm. I was the first one who commented and it was oh, I tagged me? and then I tagged three people. I tagged uh, yeah. Anton, Naaman, and Adam because he asked uh, for wholesale contractors. And because I don't wholesale, I knew the answer, but I wanted somebody that's more of an expert to answer and to give them the contract, right? And just like you said, we had all these people like, hey, dude, I can help you. You should do this. You shouldn't do this. The buyer can give you the contract, but I would recommend you use your own contract. So it's a community of investors that are looking to, that want everybody to succeed. And that's why it's very, that's, that's why it works because it's not just, hey, it's a course and then you have a Zoom call and then people are in the background and that's it. Once the call is over, Everybody goes to their home and then we'll see you next Monday. No, it's not that, right? There's communication going on every single day on Slack, people people sharing on Instagram, people having calls with other people. Uh, like it's really cool to, to see how people tag you and I, Felipe, of private calls that they're doing on Zoom about them networking, building relationships, all of that stuff. And that is the power of Red Race 205 really like that people in rat race are stepping up to creating micro tribes within rat race, mm -hmm. like wholesaler tribes or this tribe or reading books together. I think it's really awesome that people are starting to do that organically. And that's just another level of uh, rat race, right? It's like mm -hmm. in rat race to fi, people are starting to step up and take leadership in certain roles without us telling them to. And I think that's the ultimate sign of a leader. So I'm super excited about that. Really yeah. quick, Diego, I'm going to go through the list. Uh, so that people know what it was. And if you missed any of it, you can go back and listen. Number one was how to start investing if I'm in college. Number two was pay down debt or invest. Number three, my parents won't let me invest. How do I do that at 21? What if the market turns? What do I do? What strategy is best? Uh, you hear everything out there. My spouse doesn't want to buy real estate. What do I do? Number seven, what do you tell yourself if you had to start over or if you lost it all? How do you plan your goals? What do you look for up to the most? Who do you look up to uh, and why? And does Rat Race Defy Your Mastermind work? I think we've given great examples of answers to the 10 questions. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I like how we both give our own 
types of uh, opinions, right? And based on that, the knowledge, based on our experiences, we had to share all about that. So it's cool. 100%. Before we go, Diego, I'm gonna ask you one last question off the top of my head, and then we're gonna go from there and then we can close it up. Last question, Diego, who are you in high school? And would we have been friends? Oh man, we were talking about this. <laughs> the question is, who was I in high school? Yeah. Yeah, so who was I in high school? I was the kid that was quiet and that would get A's. That was me. Like I would study. Uh, I still did sports. I did cross country, soccer, track. Uh, I was in technology, so I did TSA, but I was more of like the quiet kid. Um, competitive on the education side. Yeah. Would we have been friends in a joking manner? I told you like we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have even been in the same classes. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why Straight I wanted up. you to say that. Straight you up. You told me in the car, you were like, bro, how would we have been friends? We wouldn't have been even in the same classes. I was in advanced. <laughs> yeah. I was in the <laughs> ID program. Yeah. <laughs> completely different. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. So we wouldn't funny. have known each other. Same, now, this, same. We this... would have been in the same grade, but would not have. Yeah. yeah. It's funny though, because that came from, I told you that one out and now I'm going to get sympathy from the yeah. listeners. No, it's good. I, I was, I was always known as like in class, they would always in our class. And I didn't get this until I was older in our class. They would separate the kids into penguins and eagles. And like, I always, I was a penguin. Like I was like, okay, cool. Like that's just the name or the, the, the animal that I was assigned. Now that I'm older, I realized that that meant that I couldn't fly and the eagles could fly. So the eagles were like advanced readers and math and science. And like, I was told men, so I was a penguin. You were the penguin. <laughs> and I was a penguin. So now we send memes back and forth. Anyways, that's the Rat Race to Fight podcast. Guys, if you're listening, thank you so much. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Felipe Mejia, R-E-I, and then Diego at Real Diego Corzo on Instagram. All right, guys. Thank you so much. See you, Diego. Bye, penguin. I mean, Felipe. Take care. <laughs> the Rat Race to Buy podcast where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place.